Now I would like to invite Ms. N. Krishnaveni, Senior Advocate, Chairperson of Lexicon to come over to the dais. Thank you ma'am. Now I request the guest speaker, Honorable Dr. Justice Anita Suman to be escorted to the dais. Now I request Mr. M. Natarajan, Vice President, to honor the guest speaker of the session with a memento. Now I request Ms. J. Lakshmi Prasanna, Executive Member of MMBA, to adorn the speaker with a traditional shawl. Thank you, Lordship. Thank you, ma'am. Now, on behalf of MMBA, I would like to share a few words about the guest speaker. Honorable Dr. Justice Anita Suman hails from a family of leading lawyers practicing income tax law. Dr. Justice Anita Suman was awarded doctorate in international taxation, electronic commerce by the National Law School of India University, Bangalore. An expert in taxation law, Honorable Dr. Justice Anita Suman participated in the International Visitor Leadership Program, popularly known as IVLP, on U.S. financial systems in the year 2005. Dr. Justice Anita Suman was a part of the first all-women full bench of Madras High Court hearing reference on ESI Act, a full bench comprising only women judges was constituted in the year 2020 to hear a case pertaining to the application of the ESI Act on aided and unaided educational institutions. The full bench comprised Justice Pushpa Satyanarayana, Justice Anita Suman and Justice P.T. Asha. If two friends ask you to judge a dispute, do not accept because you will lose one friend. On the other hand, if two strangers come with the same request, accept because you will gain one friend. Father of our nation, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, has once said, My joy was boundless. I had learned the true practice of law. I had learned to find out the better side of human nature to enter into man's heart. I realized that the true function of a lawyer was to unite parties driven as tender. The lesson indelibly burnt into me that a large part of my time during the 20 years of my practice as a lawyer was occupied in bringing out a private compromise of hundreds of cases. I lost nothing thereby, not even money, certainly not my soul. When this being the position even 100 years ago, we cannot we do it now? Certainly, we cannot avoid conflict, but we can always find ways to compromise. With this, may I now request Honorable Dr. Justice Anita Suman to impact us on the subject methods of alternate dispute resolution. Respected Justice Ramasubramaniam, my esteemed colleagues, distinguished invitees, guests, the President and the team of the MMBA, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. I think Ms. Janaki here has set the tone by quoting Mahatma Gandhi and the endorsement that he had given to uh, alternate systems of dispute resolution. When uh, Mr. Srinivas Raghavan asked me for a preferred slot in today's symposium, I only requested for a slot in the forenoon, expecting that I might perhaps be able to catch an early flight back. But I think it's most unfair of him to place me after Justice Ram Subramaniam. It's a tall order indeed to rise up to that level of research, clarity in thought and presentation. And I'm banking and hoping that the, the intellectual aura that he has put us all in now will somehow help to tide me over my session as well. I am not very sure what the organizers expected of this session when this theme was uh, bandied about and discussed. But I took a cue from the other themes 
where it was not technical subjects in the sense of discussing the enactments or the provisions. So, if you are expecting a discussion on the statutory provisions or on AFCONs uh, or on other uh, landmark case law, then this is not the hall to be in. I am uh, planning on outlining to the best of what I could gather over the last uh, week or so, the history of dispute resolution systems, both internationally and uh, domestically. And so it is going to be a largely academic presentation. Now my presentation will be divided into three parts. The first will be the history of dispute resolution world over. The second will be a brief outline of what dispute resolution has been domestically or in India. And the last section will be a thought as to whether this process has come full circle. We are today poised to uh, examine, analyze and shift to mediation as a form of dispute resolution. At least that is the attempt now. So the last segment will be devoted to that. Now, India is a late entrant if you compare us with the dispute resolution systems worldwide, both informal and formal. Now, when I say informal and formal, informal would mean the systems of negotiation, conciliation, discussion and settlement of disputes that we have had in an informal sense from many, many centuries past. A formal system would be a, an institutionalized system like a court system which we are all familiar with. So while formal courts and institutionalized legal systems could have been said to have commenced in India from perhaps the 1800s with structures that we are familiar with today such as appellate hierarchies or uh, jury systems to begin with etc. Formal systems or institutionalized systems were known much, much long ago in several, um, in several countries, several states. For instance, ancient Greece, even as early as in 400 BC. In fact, one of the articles had made a very exhaustive and interesting study of the institutionalized systems in ancient Greece. And uh, Aristotle is said to have preferred the informal methods of dispute resolution because in Greece they had the jury system and those juries comprised 500 to 1000 members. Imagine the confusion. And he is said to have preferred the informal system primarily because imagine bribery for 500 to 1000 jury members. The scale of bribery was so much that he said, no, this is not a good system at all. I think we should prefer uh, informal systems. Of course, that is not the only reason why he preferred it. But I will later refer to uh, his thoughts on what dispute resolution systems must be. Clearly, corruption had taken very strong roots in Greece even then. Now, there is a very interesting publication that I found which sets out a timeline of ADR. And I would like to share that timeline with you. This is a, a publication called by Jerome T. Barrett, which is a history of alternate dispute resolution systems worldwide. And it starts, it all starts as early as 1800 BC. And he talks about the Mari Kingdom in modern Syria, which uses mediation and arbitration disputes interstate in their business. Then 1400 BC, the ancient Egyptian Amarna system of international relations where they used diplomacy. 1200 to 900 BC, the Phoenicians in the eastern Mediterranean practiced entrepreneurship widely and they all used negotiation as a method of dispute resolution. Then we are familiar with the, the uh, settlement of the dispute by King Solomon where the child was taken to him with two competing mothers and he says let's split the child in two and give half of a child to each one of you and the mother says the no 
my child cannot be hurt. So that's uh, perhaps one parable that all of you are familiar with that is dated to 960 BC. 700 BC, the Rhodian Sea Law codified international rules for determining liability for ship cargo losses and used an informal method of dispute resolution. Now this timeline by this author places the panchayats that we have in India around 500 BC. So you will see that there were dispute resolution systems available far earlier and the panchayats that we are familiar with as an informal system are placed somewhere in the date line as five, at 500 BC. 400 BC Greeks used public arbitrators in city states and the awards of those public arbitrators were published in the pillars of their temples. So it was available for public scrutiny, it was available for people to learn from. 300 BC Aristotle came publicly out in his praise of arbitration over courts. We saw some of the reasons why. 100 BC Western Zhou dynasty establishes the post of mediator. In fact, Justice Ram Subramaniam referred to uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the dictum or one of those incidents involving the Chinese dynasties. But in 100 BC, they had the post of mediator. How effective it was in ensuring an equitable decision, we are not aware. But mediation was available as a dispute resolution system as early as in 100 BC. In 452 AD, Attila the Hun swept across Europe, destroyed city after city and Pope Leo the Great, as he was then, successfully negotiated that the city of Ravenna, which was Rome's western capital, must be, must be safe, must not be destroyed by Attila the Hun. This was an informal method by which that dispute was solved. 1000 AD European law merchants used negotiation in their business dealings. 1263 King Alfonso the Wise of Spain directed the use of binding arbitration with the publication of the Siet Partide. 1400 Venice established the first overseas diplomatic offices. 1632, Irish arbitration law provided for a statutory basis for arbitration. Far before any country thought of a statutory basis for arbitration, enshrining it in the law. We will see that US and India did it only a few centuries later. 1624 to 1664, during the Dutch colonial period, Commercial arbitration was in wide use in New York City. 1664 to 1776, in the British colonial period, commercial arbitration continued and flourished. In 1750s, Benjamin Franklin, who was Pennsylvania's Indian commissioner, there is a public report that he has given, where he says that I have learnt the art of persuasion, compromise and consensus building from Native Americans. He has also printed some of their peace documents, how the natives had studied the use of persuasion, particularly persuasion, because we find that in mediation, persuasion is the soul of mediation. So that dates back to the 1750s. 1770, George Washington placed an arbitration clause, interestingly, in his will. He said that if there are any disputes that arise, in the sharing of my assets, nobody shall go to court. Imagine just leaving a thought with you, how nice it would be if all the testamentary disputes that we have now could be solved all by mediation because there is a clause in the will. I leave it to the lawyers here to ruminate on the possibilities of that. One where I tried to get a copy of the will online, but uh, I was not able to lay hands on it. 1776 to 1785, Ben Franklin, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson negotiated in Europe on behalf of a weak United States, establishing a diplomatic history for the nation, which was a very nascent young nation at that time. In 1865, Generals Lee and Grant negotiated the terms of the South Surrender, ending the Civil War. That was a historic negotiation. 1886, General Howard 
instituted arbitration and employment agreements between erstwhile owners and their slaves as to how they should go forth in arriving at an, an amicable resolution bearing in mind that their relationship till then had been slave and owner. 1888 was the first arbitration act that was passed in the United States. I will stop the timeline here and go back to the main presentation because it is around that time, a few decades later, that we have the first institutionalized arbitration that was enacted in the Indian Arbitration Act as well. We will come to that presently. Now, uh, just to complete this thought on the international aspect of it, while domestically progress was going on in enacting laws to institutionalized, inter institutionalized arbitration, the international community was negotiating and entering into conventions over the years and this shaped the course of dispute resolution internationally. 1927 Geneva Convention on the Execution of Foreign Arbitral Awards, you are familiar with that. 1958 Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, that is the New York Convention. The 1969 European Convention on International Commercial Arbitration. 65 Convention on Settlement of Investment Disputes between States and Nationals of Other States, that is the Washington or the ICSID Convention. So, this is where we stand internationally when it comes to the development of dispute resolution. You will see that I have kept it general, though I have tried to outline when informal dispute resolution and formal dispute resolution took hold in various parts of the world. Now coming to the second part of my presentation which is the history of dispute resolution in India. We saw in this dateline that panchayats have been the main mode of dispute resolution as far as India was India or the India that we knew at that time was concerned particularly in rural times. It was an accepted mode of dispute resolution in villages. Now in kingdoms we had Adhikrit Adhikritas and Ripas who were appointed to hear disputes and in the Mughal courts they were referred to as the Qazis. One reason why I should thank the organizers for this conference is that it made me pull out my copies of Amarchitra Katha and made me feel nostalgic about the tales of Tenali Raman and Maria Rama. In India, we are familiar with the wit and wisdom. They went together. It was not just wit, but a lot of wisdom in how those, they were called Vikatakavis because they were court jesters, but their main function was to arrive at creative and out of the box solutions when people brought their problems to the court. They are not persons who are uh, fictitious, they are actual persons whose, uh, of course, we find that uh, if you attribute thousand uh, uh, decisions to them, perhaps 50 percent will be actually attributable to them. But be that as it may, it shows the impact that they had on justice delivery at that time. For instance, Denali Raman was in the court of Krishnadevaraya in the Vijayanagaram uh, empire and there was one instance that I found interesting. Denali Raman was walking around in the court gardens and uh, the king at that point in time had a lovely rose garden. He had brought in varieties of rose from different parts of the world and he was very, very proud of the varieties that he had. He used to take the flowers and offer them to the deity every day. A complaint had come to him saying that Tanali Raman son was actually taking away the roses and the king being the diplomat that he was did not want to charge the son without having a word with Tanali Raman or taking his counsel on it. So what he did was he told him Tanali Raman why don't you just take a walk around my gardens to see how things are, are my prized possessions, my roses, are they secure, are they safe from people who want to come and pillage them. So Tenali Raman gets to hear from, from one of the uh, soldiers that this is the actual purpose for which he has been asked to go. So when he is walking around, 
he finds the boy loitering around there the boy has been seen plucking the flowers and tenali raman realizes that he is caught because his boy is actually caught in the act what do you do about it so he thinks quickly and then before the boy could be caught by the guard unawares he loudly says that a child with a mouth will survive he says now nobody can incriminate him for that statement it's a general statement that he makes but evidently the boy is his son because he understands what he says and he just eats the roses up thorns and all and when the guard goes to get the boy he finds him empty handed well i wonder what will happen with a solution like that in today's times there will be manifold appeals the poor child will be uh, will have to go through all kinds of harassments one more instance and this i get from an actual amar chitra katha that i had the pleasure to dust off and read maria da rama was uh, not a man who was uh, none of these people are trained in the law maria da rama was just a little village boy a little village lad but he was street smart and while he was just sitting in his village one day gossiping he heard a loud commotion about an old woman who had been sentenced to death and uh, he says how did it happen and then he is told the story which you will be patient to to please listen to there was this old lady in the village who had been entrusted with a pot of gold coins by four friends and the condition on which they entrusted that pot to her was they said you must hold this pot of gold with you you must return it to only the four of us when we come together to take it from you if one of us come separately you will not give it to them so she says all right she keeps it in the corner there and a few days later all four of them pass by they sit on her porch her tinnai and a buttermilk vendor goes past so they want to buy buttermilk they depute one of the friends inside to get a pot from her an empty pot what they mean is bring an empty pot to collect the buttermilk and that fellow taking benefit of it goes inside and tells her look we left a pot with you please give us that pot she says no no i have to give it to an all, only all four of you ask so he says see my friends are just outside you may check with them so the unsuspecting lady goes to the window and says look your friend is here he wants the pot shall i give it and uh, she is careless not to mention which pot the friends are careless not to ask which pot they proceed on the basis that she is referring to the empty pot but she gives him the pot of gold and happily this fellow goes out through the back door she wonders why is he going out through the back door but leaves it at that and uh, these people are waiting outside forever subsequently they come in and say what happened to the pot and she says what do you mean your friend came i checked with you and i have given it to him and then they take her they drag her to the king's court and say that now she has to pay us back the gold evidently that's not possible so then she is sentenced to death the king saying that you've broken the contractual terms the contract was for you to give it to an only all four ask so you have broken the contractual terms and i will condemn you to the gallows maria da rama feels that this may be the application of law but it's not justice it's not equitable so he goes to the king and he says boldly look i think you have made a mistake in your decision i wonder what we as judges will do if somebody was to come and tell us that look you have made a mistake in your decision yes so uh, the king was amused and he says all right let's hear what you have to say on this and maria da rama then says all right the terms of the contract are for the pot to be returned if all four of the friends ask her for it so all four of you ask her for it and then she will return it and there ended the matter because the three friends know that they will never find the fourth man who has made off with the pot of gold so it becomes an impossibility and because of this the old lady is saved now why have i taken the time to tell you all this just to say that in times of your what was used was creative ways of solving problems and uh, it is not mere application of law but application of something more that that led to justice dispensation now going forth with my timeline come the british 
The 1787 regulation empowered courts functioning then to refer suits to arbitration. Thereafter, we had the Bengal Resolution of 1793, which is Act 16 of 1793, which empowered courts to address arbitration disputes with the consent of parties where the suit value did not exceed 200 rupees. Primarily, such dis disputes would relate to uh, maintenance of accounts or award of shares in a partnership, non-performance non of contractual obligations, settlement of debts, etc. Now, while Regulation 15 of 1795 extended the 1793 resolution to the territory of Madras, Regulation 21 extended the resolution to territories ceded by the Nawab. The 73 resolution was extended to cover the presidency of Bombay in 1827. The 1859 Civil Procedure Code had Chapter 6, Sections 312 to 327 that empowered courts barring the Supreme and the Small Causes Court to refer disputes to arbitration. And the amendments in the 19 Not Act, which you are all familiar with, provided for 89 for settlement of disputes outside the court by reference to arbitration, conciliation, judicial settlement, including Lok Adalat or mediation. Now, coming to Indian enactments that dealt specifically with the alternate dispute resolution mechanisms, the Indian Arbitration Act is of the year 1899. It was the first Indian legislation to deal with ADR and provided that matters could be settled between the parties without court supervision. All other matters were left to the purview of the second schedule of the 1908 CPC, which was repealed when the 1940 Arbitration Act came in. Now, there is uh, in the first edition to uh, the uh, a commentary on the Indian Arbitration Act, I just wanted to read this to you. The commentary was by late H. N. Morrison Esquire, Barrister at Law of the Middle Temple. And in the first uh, edition, this is his preface, short and sweet. In this volume, has been incorporated all the statute law in force in British India upon the subject of arbitration. Explanatory notes and references to important judicial decisions have been supplied to the text where considered necessary and the rules framed by the High Courts of Calcutta and Bombay will be found in the appendix. Rules are under consideration by the High Court of Madras and the Chief Court of Burma. And then he concludes, this is what I found interesting. He says, the frequency of arbitration clauses in business contracts induces the author to trust that this work will be of assistance to mercantile firms as well as to the legal profession. I found a very similar approach in, our, uh, in what somebody would say in a preface to a, a dispute resolution book today. And this is dated 7th May 1901, one and a quarter centuries ago. So, well, the world is not really so different today as it was one and a half centuries ago in some senses, perhaps. The 1940 Arbitration Act consolidated and amended laws of arbitration, but it was found wanting in several aspects when compared with the developments that were happening internationally. Thus was born the 1996 Act, with which you are all familiar. Uh, now, the 1996 Act, interestingly, provides for arbitration and conciliation. And there is only an incidental reference to mediation in Section 30, which states that it is not incompatible with an arbitration agreement for an arbitral tribunal to encourage settlement of the dispute and with the agreement of the parties, the tribunal may use mediation, conciliation or other procedures in vogue at the time when the proceedings were taking place. This sums up section 2 that deals with domestic, the trajectory that the enactments, statutory developments have taken. And I will now come to the last section of my presentation. We find that both formal and informal systems had their rules. It is not that informal systems did not have rules. 
with the informal systems deployed rough and ready methods of arriving at their conclusions. They had their own honor codes, some of them which may not be fair and equitable, but they did all the same. The codes, the informal methods were deeply influenced by vagaries of social hierarchies and the conditions that were prevalent then. Their decision was final. Courts, as we know, are not just bound by institutional rules, but also statutes, rules and regulations and scientific methods of assessing evidence and drawing conclusions. Now, there was one common feature that was there in both the formal and informal uh, methods and that was that they were centric to the authority that was dispensing justice. Earlier, that authority's decision was final. Today, we would have intra-court and inter-court appeals, etc. But their decision was final and it was centric to them. Recently, there has been a market shift and this shift is what is the sum and substance of my third, uh, the concluding part of my presentation. While amicable solutions were available earlier, today with the mediation bill which is now there, we find that we are seeking to institutionalize a mode of dispute resolution that is entirely party driven or voluntary. And that in my view makes a very, very important shift because to the best of my research, I found that this is the first time that at least India, I don't know abroad, I cannot claim information info, uh, internationally on this, at least in India, this is the first time that a voluntary method of dispute resolution which is entirely driven by the parties is, is sought to be enshrined in a statute. Now, the mediation bill itself is out there and this is not a conference or a session to deal with uh, the mediation bill. But very briefly, one important thing is that government disputes can also be mediated under the uh, uh, bill once it uh, passes muster. Of course, with the exclusion of commercial contracts because section 6 of the bill says that it is the Commercial Courts Act and the provisions that are set out there that will apply as far as commercial contracts are concerned. But it is a great beginning that the government, which is the largest litigator, is also entitled to use mediation. Of course, the mediated settlement has to be signed off by a competent authority and this makes uh, sense because it has to stand the test of uh, uh, the settlement. About a year ago, we had a conference when many of us were traveling from one uh, uh, location to another and Justice Ram Subramanian was there in the airport with us and the topic for discussion was that came up was uh, the debate between uh, whether judges are expected to do justice or whether they are just uh, supposed to, the, the, the debate between constitutional morality and personal morality which is an ongoing and never ending debate and I remember that he brought us all down to earth in his inimitable style when he said that Look, judges are settling disputes. Don't have any false notions in your minds that you are dispensing judges, uh, justice or doing any divine duty or anything more than just deciding a problem that is before you. That is a debate that I find happened as early in the 4th century between Plato and Aristotle. And... Uh, if you will please uh, bear with me. I would just like to read two passages from Aristotle's rhetoric where he was a great proponent of arbitration. Well, I would say arbitration because at that time it was only arbitration which was an informal method of uh, uh, dispute resolution. Today, when we say, when we look at it, we would perhaps say that mediation is what he had in mind. But please listen to this. In his rhetoric, he says, epiakia, which is the Greek word for equity, is justice that goes beyond the written law. Omissions occur either willingly or unwillingly in respect to legislators. Omissions are unwilling if the legislators have overlooked the omission, but are willing 
when they cannot distinguish the matter generally, but were compelled to speak as if the things in question were universal, even though they were not, but in fact were true most of the time. And such is the case whether it is not easy to determine a matter on account of an infinite number of cases, such as wounding with an iron instrument, how large and of what kind, there would not be any life left if one should try to count them all. Thus, if a matter cannot be defined more precisely, but there be a need for legislation about it, it is necessary to speak broadly. If a man wearing a ring were to raise his hand or actually strike another, he is liable according to the written law concerning wounding with an iron instrument and has committed an injustice. But he has not committed an injustice according to what is true and that is equity. I don't know if the audience has put the mic man up to this. Only two more paragraphs and then I'll conclude. If equity is what has been said, it is manifest what kinds of things are equitable and what not, and what men are not equitable. And it is equitable to excuse things characteristically human, and to look not to the law, but towards the lawgiver, and not to the letter of the law, but to the intention of the lawgiver, and not to the action, but to the purpose, and not to the part, but to the whole, not to how someone is now, but to how he was, either always or most of the time, and to remember being treated well rather than badly, and the good received rather than done, and to be patient though being wronged, and to prefer to be judged by reason, that is logos, over deeds, and to prefer to go to arbitration than to court. For the arbitrator sees the equitable, but the citizen juror only the law. And it is because of this that the arbitrator was invented so that the equitable might prevail. There is a very interesting uh, uh, thesis that is available online that has been submitted by one Andrew Sucre for his uh, JD in the Harvard Law School 2008. And there he sums up the, the debate between Plato and Aristotle. He says, a very short paragraph, I promise you. In the rhetoric, Aristotle discusses the concept of equity. Plato had contrasted equity with justice in the laws, arguing that equity, because it is distinct from strict justice, which is good, cannot itself be good. Aristotle explicitly rejects Plato's analysis, claiming that although equi equity is not identical with strict justice, it is nonetheless a kind of justice. Both equity and legal justice are species of generic justice. What is the relevance of this to my presentation? I find that mediation appeals to a cultured mind, to a mind which rises above the win-all aspect, which is the cornerstone of litigation. Mediation cannot succeed unless one is willing to give as much as one is willing to take. My experience in mediation has not been uh, uh, very, what shall I say, it has not been, uh, I, it has not resulted in a dispute uh, being solved. Do I have another five minutes? Five minutes. Uh, the the uh, dispute that was referred to me was between the inmates of a senior citizen home and the management of the senior citizen home itself. And they had an entire set of difficulties that they said were not being redressed by the management. Now, when it came to small difficulties such as setting up a community hall or putting up a theater, making a walking track, making the place secure, all this the management was willing to do. But they had one which became the point of no return. And that is they said, look, we are all senior citizens. We have purchased the plot from you. And when, when we decide... At our, at our, uh, uh, at a, you know, at a time when we decide is right, that we don't want these plots. We want you to buy it back from us at the price at which we purchased it from you. And that the management said is not possible for commercial reasons. They said, look, while we evidently believe that senior citizens have to be taken care of, we cannot, and they run a whole group of senior citizens home all over the country. So they said, if we do it in one place, we will have to do it in every center of ours, and we will have a glut of property with us. 
which we cannot monetize in any way and we'll have to shut shop so there are many situations where perhaps the mediator was not good enough i was not able to arrive at a decision which would be a win win now what is a win win a win win can be something entirely different from what the parties have thought of just to call in a conference on mediation gave us uh, an example of an infringement suit that he was hearing there was a very uh, a multinational a very big jeans apparel manufacturer and he was threatened by somebody using his uh, uh, trademark so they filed a suit and the uh, justice call felt that he could mediate it and the decision that uh, he arrived at was something that both of them were happy with the resolution was that evidently the company feels that the little fellow is a threat otherwise he would not have filed a suit so he says your your business model is being run well you have good labor your uh, output is good the quality of your products is good why don't you allow yourself to be bought over by the multinational with the buying over of the uh, domestic uh, person the threat of infringement goes he gets a good price for his business and the multinational also gets a very good unit so their productivity also increases so that's a win win and perhaps it is likely that there is a win win like this available in every dispute that comes but the mediator has to be skilled enough to see it i'll just conclude by saying that the decision that ultimately i uh, arrived at was that traditional methods adversarial methods are like allopathic medicine and indigenous uh, methods would perhaps like your uh, ayurveda or homeopathy etc would be more aligned with the uh, uh, mediation just compare the two allopathy gives you a quick fix it takes care of the pain for now you get your interim order you're happy right but it has its side effects but if you go for an indigenous or an organic or a holistic system of medicine the results may take a little longer you have to be a lot more patient but you will address the underlying problem and perhaps your dispute will be solved for all time thank you so much for a very patient hearing and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity thank you lord chief for taking us through the historical aspect of dispute resolution and its application over the period of time as your lord chief said why la pillai ran pulaikam may i now request mrs sudarsana manivannan to offer her understanding on the lecture good morning everyone as joseph greinbaum once said an ounce of mediation is worth a pound of arbitration and a ton of litigation and who better to vouch for this court than her ladyship who has vociferously advocated for mediation in every step of her way and has truly embodied section 89 of the cpc it is truly an honor to provide uh, my humble feedback in today it is well known that her ladyship is a member of the tamil nadu uh, committee for mediation and conciliation center and she has today left no stone unturned and has covered all essentials of arbitration luckily for all of us very unfortunate for me because i have very few things to add here uh, her ladyship started off with the history of dispute resolution took us through an outline of dispute resolution both domestic and international and whether we have come a full uh, circle today she started by saying that india may have been a little late to the party with respect to mediation our mythology was not pretty late my favorite is with respect to vidura nidhi where uh, the question of impartiality was uh, embodied by vidura himself famous mediators like lord krishna and my favorite infamous non mediators like narada whom who ensured that non mediatable disputes went to litigation and straight up war this uh, when it was absolutely necessary it made me think of schedule 2 of the mediation bill of 2021 which talks about any dispute which is non mediatable and which shall not be referred to mediation her ladyship uh, made us understand in very uh, layman terms through amar chitra katha stories kind of awoke the inner child in me and the it made me think that i should bring the essential principles of adr and use it in my daily life um, my ladyship i have a 15 month old child and a niece who really they love the same toys so i think i i should uh, apply the principles of mediation here and ensure that i don't 
impose a solution and create a conducive environment for the parties and ensure that the parties are satisfied and it is a win-win situation for them, which is ultimately a win-win situation for me. Her ladyship through simple and witty stories substantiated the importance of emotions that run through in uh, alternate dispute resolutions. And it is very essential because matrimonial disputes and family disputes in general form 30% of all mediation disputes as per the latest research. Her ladyship took us through all the conventions governing alternate dispute resolution and also regarding the evolution of Indian legislations in arbitration. Uh, it also reminded me of Birbal's story. Uh, my lord, if I may be permitted to share. So once uh, King Akbar's cart, his chariot was stuck in the mud at night and it was very cold. So he announced a reward for anyone who would be able to take the, the, the who, who will be able to take the wheel that was stuck in the mud. But he also imposed a condition. He said that whoever takes it out of the mud should ensure that they are not wearing any warm clothing. That is uh, nothing to pr protect you from the cold. So there was a person who was able to do the uh, complete the task. He came the next day to Akbar's court to claim his reward. King Akbar was very surprised. He asked him, how, would, how did you manage the cold? And he said, uh, there was a small light that was, uh, that was glowing some 100 feet away. I looked at it and I derived metaphorical warmth from it and I was able to complete my task. So later, he said, see, the condition was that you are not supposed to use any tools to uh, enable yourself to uh, battle the cold. Since you have not done that, I cannot give you your reward. So Birbal thought this was very unfair. So, but he didn't say anything. As the good old mediator he was, he wanted to create a conducive environment and not impose a solution. So, the next day he was late to court and Akbar asked, where, where is Birbal? And Birbal sent word and said, I am making kichdi. I will come when the kichdi is made. So, what happened? It took over three hours and he was still not there. So, Akbar himself went to Birbal's house to find out what was happening. And they found that there was a small candle lit in the bottom of the house where there was a hole and the, the pot of kichdi was hung in the ceiling and he said I am using this light to ensure that the kichdi is cooked and Akbar said how is that possible I said and he says this is the exact logic that you applied with respect to the man who helped with your cart so here I can't uh, help but think of how the principles of mediation do apply here um, I would like to conclude by sincerely thanking her ladyship for her time and uh, knowledge here and almost like selling ice to Eskimos, she has uh, instilled her love for out-of-court settlements to an audience full of uh, advocates and judges. And I would like to end with one of uh, her ladyship's favorite quotes, Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu, let there be happiness. Thank you. I thank Mr. Sudarshana for her valuable feedback. With this, the second session concludes.